and wish that we are all familiar with those subjects so that as we go through this history you may realize that there's a way mark here that I've put on the board like 2019 uh, and 2021 so I believe you have familiarized yourself how we arrived 2019 and 2021. So as we'll be looking at the subject of Islam, we've been going to Revelation chapter 9. And Revelation chapter 9 is the, the word trumpet and the principles that we have been using to understand this model is the principle of trip application, whereby we look at the first war And then we add the second war, which equals what? The third war. And we want to look at the third war. We combine this history. When you say you add first war to the second war, you, what we really need, you just want to, to understand those two history, which will give us, which acts as a template to understand the third war. Just like the principle of first world war one, world war two, give us the nature of the third world war and our brother Amos has been taking us through the principles rather the understanding of the Bible the methodology and if you are keen as he was taking us through the principles of parables he we were confronted rather we realized that we have these principles of natural and then what the spiritual so the natural act as what our box we want to understand the historical setting of every detail that we are going to be given based on that narrative. Then, to understand the spiritual, the natural is going to dictate us how the spiritual is going to look like. Is that true? So the natural illustrates what? The spiritual. The natural is what? The known. And then the spiritual is what? They are known. So the natural is going to give us a, a story how the spiritual is going to look like. It's going to, it's like it, the natural is acting like a key to unlock how the spiritual is going to look like. So in this history, in this, on this board, what do you think is going to be a natural story? So this line is going to be what? A natural story. And then this one is going to be what? The spiritual. the spiritual. So it's the understanding of the natural that will help us to conceptualize what? The spiritual. So we, yesterday we went into this line and we did not finish it. And I'm purposing by God's grace to cover this history so that in our uh, preceding or rather in our studies we are going to continue with other, other model like Numbers 22 and Luke 21, the angry of the nation, which will take us to the Millerite history. We understand their context, how they approach Daniel 11, Daniel 11 verse 40, a very complex uh, verse, which you need, needs a critical examination. So I want us to go to a Bible to review this history, 606 AD. And I'll just remind us that 606 AD, I like referring us to the 1850 Charter Foundation. This is where you're going to see 606 AD, which says the rise of who? Mahomet, the Mahometan. So we read from the book of Revelation chapter 9 verse 1 and we are told that and the fifth trumpet sounded and I saw, I saw a star fall from heaven to the earth and to him was given what? The key of the bottomless pit. So that is verse 1. And uh, at that we saw a star. So this star is going to fall from heaven to the earth. And when it falls to the earth, there is a punctuation there. And then we have additional information going to be added. And what is that additional information? Say, to him was given the key of what? Of the bottomless pit. And this him is a pronoun, is an individual. And we identify this individual to be who? Mahomet. So Mahomet is going to be given what? A key. And when it's going to be given a key, it's going to open what? The bottomless pit. Uh, the key 
We identify from the book of Revelation chapter 3 verse 7. Christ says what? I'm the one who has the key and they have the power to do what? To open and to do what? To shut. So the key is a symbol of what? Power. So you want to see what is this power that Mohammed had for him to do what? To arise. Because when you have power, you have that capability. You have that credibility to do what you want to do. So he went to that history of the pioneers, how they understood the Revelation 9 verse 1, and they gave us an explicit explanation that that key was the battle of what? Nineveh. If we were to draw uh, this map, uh, let me assume this is the this is Rome. And this Rome, we have uh, the western side of it, and then we have here what? The east. And here, the first four trumpets are going to ravage the western empire to disintegrate it into how many regions? Ten regions. We are going to have ten horns of Daniel 7, of the terrible beast. And I believe we have uh, an explanation how we arrive at these ten horns. So we are going to have ten horns here, but when we have the ten horns, what happened in the east, we are going to have the little horn rising, uprooting how many horns? Three horns. So we are going to have here the seven uh, kings remaining. So the little horn is going to uproot uh, three. And this is an apostate church. As a result, the first four barbarian tribes have ravaged the western region of the Roman Empire. In the West, what is happening, God is going to allow another religion, another false religion can say as we were looking at the, at the, the rise of Mahomet. He's going to allow another religion to come in the West to ravage what? To, to ravage the, the Eastern Empire, Constantinople, and at the same time to do what? To be a scourge against this apostate church that is rising where? In the West. So that is the reason why God allowed this uh, power on the East side to arise. And I want to remind us, when we are looking at the western, eastern side of the eastern uh, Rome, you realize that we have some powers like who? Persia and who? Greece, okay? So someone may, may, may be wondering, why are we identifying, like some, for example, we have Persia and, 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 and Greece here. Even in this history, we have the Christian Empire, Chris, uh, Emperor John Paleogius, we have him here. Why are we not speaking about Rome as an empire that is being ravaged by, by, by Islam? That is the critical question that we need to ask ourselves. And I'm going to answer it like this one. Uh, when you go to Daniel 2, just to remind us, we have this great image it's portrayed in symbols, and those symbols, they give us an impressive history of the world. First, we have what? Babylon, we have Middle Persia, Greece, and what? Rome. We have one kingdom here, and this kingdom is just the kingdom of the north, but it comes in how many dispensations? Four dispensations, Babylon, Middle Persia, Greece, and Rome. And when Babylon had the crown of the king of the north, it was subdued by who? Middle Persia. Middle Persia was subdued by who? Greece. But when Middle Persia conquers uh, Babylon, it doesn't mean that Babylon ceased to do what? To exist. It was still there, but it's under the jurisdiction of who? Middle Persia. Okay? So even when Middle Persia is conquered and Greece takes the crown of the king of the north, Babylon, Persia, they are still under the jurisdiction of who? Greece. The same thing happened when Rome comes on the stage of the earth, all those other entities, they are still under the jurisdiction of who? Rome. Together. Now, another, another illustration that we can do, I want us to turn to the book of uh, Daniel chapter 8, verse 9. Daniel 8, verse 9. In Daniel 8 verse 9, we are told, And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which works exceeding great towards the south, and toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. So what is that little horn? As we understand, is a symbol of what? Rome. So if you we were to see how Rome was coming, how Rome was uh, 
coming on stage of prophetic field, we realized that Rome took the crown of the king of the north when? 31 BC at the battle of what? Actium. That's when Rome took the crown of the king of the north. But you realize from this battle was fought Egypt. We had three uh, individuals. Cleopatra, Augustus Caesar, and Mark Anthony, all those individuals, they were connected to this battle of Actium. And this is Egypt. So when you look at Daniel 8, verse 9, it gives us how many geographical locations that Rome conquered. Three. What are those? We have, um, wait a minute, we have um, the east, the east to us, which works exceeding great towards the south, towards the east, and toward what? The pleasant, uh, pleasant uh, land. But when you look at those arrangements, you realize that when Rome began uh, taking the crown of the king of the north, it took it at the battle of Actium. And when you look at that verse, if you were to put those arrangements, we'll have something like this one. This is the Mediterranean Sea. And then here we have what? Syria on the north. And then here we have what? Egypt. And in between here, what do we have? Where is Daniel standing? In the glorious Palestine. So here we put here our God's people. They are here, Palestine. So what? I don't know how, 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 how Daniel was viewing it, but when you look at those three entities based on Daniel 8, Syria was conquered when? 65 BC. And then we have Palestine when? Okay. So we have here Syria, and we have uh, Palestine. And then we have what? Uh, Egypt. So here, Rome is going to, to conquer uh, Syria in 65 BC. And then here, 63. And then here we have what? 31 BC. So the question comes in. Before Rome ravaged these three entities, whom were they subjected to? Remember our stories from Daniel 2. Who were they subjected to? Greece. They were subjected under who? Greece. So in other words, we can say all this power were under who? Greece. You get that? So when Rome really is, is conquering these uh, entities, they are conquering, Rome is conquering the cities or rather the, 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 the countries that were under subjection to who? Greece, the third kingdom, as an empire. So when you come to this line, we'll be confronted with the issue of, of, of Greece, uh, Persia. So when you, when you are confronted with those ideas, remember, even if we are talking about Greece, they are under the jurisdiction of which kingdom? Rome, okay? Because it's Rome which is on stage of prophetic field, bearing the crown of the king of who? The north. You have to get that. So when you talk about Daniel 8 verse 9, these three entities, they are talking about Jews, uh, powers that were under the subjection of who? Greece. Are you okay with that? So don't get confused when you, we, we are identifying somebody like John Paleogias here. He was a, a Grecian, a Grecian a prince, something like that. Remember, even if he was a Grecian empire, they were still under the jurisdiction of who? Rome. And if Islam is going to ravage those kingdoms, in real sense, in directly or indirectly, they are ravaging who? Rome. You get that? Okay, because in this side, we have Constantinople, the seat of the empire. So having said that, I want just to wrap this one so that we can begin this line. Then we look at how the, uh, the spiritual look like. Uh, all right. So
So verse 1 of Revelation 9 says that I, the fifth, the fifth uh, trumpet sounded, the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So the star we identify to be a symbol of a minister, it can be good or bad, but a key, we realize that that key was the battle of, of war, Nineveh. The battle of Nineveh that was fought between two factions. That was uh, Persia, not Middle Persia, but just Persia, modern day Persia, and who? Rome. <coughs> and by this time, Persia, under the rulership of King Kosros II, he was very prominent. He was very, uh, uh, very strong against who? this side of, of Rome, the eastern part of it, because the western already had been ravaged. So Persia, Kosros, to intimidate Rome, he's going to ask them to be paying tribute, because he did not want to, to, to for example, I, I'll just remain with this structure. Here we have the seat of the empire called Constantinople, because in 330, Constantine took the seat from the east, from Rome, and took it where? Constantinople. So the seat of the empire will just be around here. So in this time period, these other regions, Persia, Greece, they will, they will still actually want to take Constantinople. So when Kosros wants to take Constantinople, the, I can say the emperor, but this time who was at Rome, he was called Heraclius. And in Persia, we have somebody called Kosros. So Kosoros, what Kosoros does, he demands Heraclius to be paying tribute, a thousand virgins, gold, in order to avoid attacking where? Constantinople. So that is the argument that they're going to, 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 to agree. But Heraclius, he's not going to be pleased with this kind of game that Persia is doing unto them. So he's, what he's going to do, he'll just pay tribute, he'll continue paying a thousand virgins, uh, all those stuff that Persia was demanding. But as he would continue doing that, he's buying time to attack who? Rome. And they are going to be they are going to meet in a very decisive war, what we call the Battle of Nineveh. And this Battle of Nineveh is going to determine the rise of Mahomet. But initially, as I had said, Mahomet is in Arabia here in Mecca. But there are two principal power that is really hindering him from doing what? From rising. I don't know where I can put uh, the map Persia and Rome. But what Mahomet and his adherents do, one of the citizens from Mecca sends a letter to Kosros. In that letter, he demands Kosros to identify Mahomet as the prophet of the Lord. But Kosros is not going to recognize that letter. In, in, in latter, he's going to tear that letter and say we don't recognize that prophet. And Mohammed is going to make a prediction that in a few years to come, Persia is going to fall fast. They are going to have a war between Rome and Persia is going to fall. So that is the prediction that he's going to, to, to make. And as he's in Arabia, is going to see this tension that is going on between Persia and Rome. And these Persia and Rome, they are going to meet in the Battle of Nineveh. In this Battle of Nineveh, Persia, they are going to fight in a very terrible manner with Rome. And as they are fighting, these two opposing sides, they are going to deplete each other's strength. They are going to be more feeble. And as they become feeble, they give a leeway for Muhammad to do what? To rise. So this battle, is the key that unlocked the rise of Mahomet from the Arabian desert from Mecca and is going, going to rise. So as Mahomet rise, is going to propagate his teachings and we are told that he opened the bottomless what? The bottomless pit. So you need also to look at the meaning of the bottomless pit and the only definition that Sister White gives us the meaning of the bottomless pit is from the book Great Controversy page 652. Uh, it, it tells us that the bottom speed is a very uh, bad region. It's uh, is describing Revelation chapter 20. So it's going to tell us that the bottom speed 
is where gross darkness is and that gross darkness if we were to look at the context of Revelation chapter 9 is the false religion of Islam and we are told that in Revelation chapter 9 verse 2 that when he opened the bottomless pit what happened there was what a smoke a smoke did what rose up and from that smoke what came up locust so when you look at the symbol of a, of a smoke what is the symbol of a smoke is a symbol of what? <coughs> Glory. When you look at Revelation chapter uh, can you just look at the other part if you want to look at the rule of first mention but let me look at Revelation if I can remember the, the, the verse Uh, Revelation chapter 15 verse, 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 seven, verse 8. Before the sounding, or rather before the plagues are poured, when you look at 8 it says, and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of, of God. So the smoke is intimately connected in this context with the glory of whom? God. But when you look at the context of Revelation chapter 9, it's not a good glory. It's a false teaching. It's a satanic glory, which is going to obscure the sun and what? And, and, and what? The air. So when you look at the meaning of the sun and the air, you can, you can equate with the Bible. And they are going, the teachings of Quran is not going to agree with the teachings of the Bible. Those are all symbology that you can look at that. But, so the person who is going to rise here is Muhammad. And Muhammad, as he goes through a long period of time, is going to get many adherents who are called what? The locusts. So when you look at the symbol of the locust, we go to the book of Genesis, uh, Exodus. We know that it was among the plagues that ravaged what? Egypt. But when you look at the meaning of, of a locust on the other part of the Bible, for example, when you go to the book of Proverbs chapter 21. Proverbs. Twenty-one. Yeah. Thirty-one, twenty-seven. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thirty, not thirty-one, but thirty. Proverbs thirty, verse twenty-seven. It says, "The locusts have no king, yet go they forth all of them in bands." So at the rise of Islam, they did not have a king, or rather, they had a what? A false. Prophet. So at the beginning of the rise of Islam, they did not have a king. Because as we go through Revelation 9, we realize that they're going to have a king. So as Muhammad is rising, he's going to die in 6 32. 632 AD, and he's going to be succeeded by who? Abu Bakr. And in Abu Bakr chapter. Revelation chapter 9, verse 4 and 5, when he succeeded, Muhammad is going to command his adherents, saying that when you go to war, we read yesterday that there's a group of people whom you are going to do what? To hurt. But there's a certain class of people, the Christians, don't hurt them because to them they had the seal of God. By that time they were keeping the Sabbath based on how the pioneer are explaining it. So the purpose of the Islam from its beginning, it was to be an attack of who? Of the false apostate church, the purpose that was rising on this side of, 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 of the kingdom of Rome. So for many centuries, we are going to come in this way, Mark, and after the death of Abu Bakr, is going to be succeeded by other caliphs, many, many of them. And when you look at verse 4 and 5, they are going to introduce something called the five months. So if we turn to Revelation chapter 9, verse 5,
uh, 9 verse 12, and to them it was given that they should not kill them, but they should be tormented five months, and their torment was the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. So our burden is to look the commencement of that five months. So as you continue, another mention of that five months is from verse 10. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there was and there was things in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. Now in these five months, something is going interesting going to happen. Verse 11. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is called who? Abaddon. But in the Greek, Greek tongue, his name is who? Apollyon. So that word Abaddon and Apollyon means destruction. So from the commencement of these five, five months, they are going to have who? A king. And this king historically is somebody called who? No, it's called Othman. Othman is going to, is the one who succeeded other caliphs, including Abu Bakr for many, uh, for many years, is going to be called Othman. His name is Othman. And Othman is going to establish what we call what? Othman Empire. So this Ottoman is going to establish what we call the Ottoman Empire. And he's, when he's establishing the Ottoman Empire, the first thing that he's going to do, which is going to help us to determine the commencement of these five months, is in the year 27, July 1299, when he's going to invade what? Nicomedia. Nicomedia was just a place near Greece. And remember Greece at this particular time is under the jurisdiction of who? Rome. So what Ottoman does for the first time is going to invade what? Nicomedia. And we read from Josiah Leach exposition. Let me check uh, the quote. Uh, this is from Stephen Haskell. Story from the Sea of Patmos, page 171, paragraph 2, it says, It was on July 27, A.D. 1299, that Othman first invaded the territory of Nicomedia, and the singular accuracy of the dead seems to disclose some foresight of the rapid and destructive growth of the monster. More than human foresight recorded this date with such definiteness. To the prophet of Patmos, it had been revealed that their power was to hurt men five months. So from the attack of Nicomedia, 27 July 1299, we are going to see the beginning of these five months. And this five months, we created it to how many years? 150 years. So throughout this period, Ottoman Empire or rather Ottoman is going to establish his empire after invading what? The territory of who? Of Nicomedia. So this what marks the beginning of five, five months. So what will be happening in these five months? From the time of Abu Bakr, it says, Prophetic Exposition, for Volume 2, page 171, paragraph 4. After the death of Mahomet, he was succeeded in the command by Abu Bakr, 632 AD, who, as soon as he had fairly established his authority and government, dispatched a circular letter to the Arabian tribes, of which the following is an extract. This is to acquaint you that I intend to send the true believers into Syria to take it out of the hand of the infidels, and I will have you know that the fighting for religion is an ex ex act of obedience to God. So this what Muhammad says, we are going to connect it with 150 years. So throughout this period, whatever war that is going to be fought, it is going to be connected with what? Religion. They are going to use religion as an ex excuse to do what? To invade other what? Territory. Muhammad, Abu Bakr says that we are going to send you where? To Syria. But remember when you go to Syria to fight, remember this is the fight of who? 
of the Lord. And if you turn with me to the book of Revelation chapter 9, verse verse uh, Verse 8, not verse 8, verse 9, it says, And they had bracelets as it was bracelet of iron, and the sound of their wings was the sound of chariot of many horses running to battle. So this battle that they, they'll be going through here in this time period of 150 years, the principal subject that they're going to echo is that this is the battle of the Lord. And Abu Bakr and other caliphs who succeeded Abu Bakr, including Othman, what they are going to tell these um, followers of Islam, they are going to tell them, remember, for you to secure paradise, you read it in the, the writings of the pioneers, for you to secure paradise, you have to fight. And remember, when you fight, this fight will secure you to be where? To be in heaven. So if you don't destroy, you are not eligible to be where? In paradise. So. The context is that this is the battle of who? Of the Lord. So that is the history that was happening here. So this beginning of these 550 years, we are going to commence it from July 27, 1299, and it's going to end where? 27 July 1449. So what will happen in July 1449? I just want to read whatever was happening in this history. This is called Holy War. To secure paradise. So it says this from Prophetic Exposition, Volume 2, page 171, paragraph 5. An explanation of what was happening in this history. It says, his messengers, that is the messengers of Abu Bakr, connect with this history, with other caliphs. His messengers returned with the tidings of pious and martial order, which they had kindled in every province. Remember, Abu Bakr already had died. He's not in this history, but the principle that he had laid down is going to be done what? To be followed, it's going to be continued. His, uh, the camp of Medina was successfully filled with the intrepid bands of the Saracen. So the Meccans, when they conquered it in 622, they are going again to conquer who, where? Medina. And as they are extending their territory towards the northern part, they are going now to extend their influence towards this surrounding what? region. But more so, they are going to attack where? Syria first. As soon as their numbers were complete, Abu Bakr ascended the hill, reviewed men, the horses, and the arms, and poured forth a fervent prayer for the success of the undertaking. Now, you see, prayer was intimately connected with the work of this individual. But who began this work of prayer? Muhammad, isn't it? At where? In Mount Safa. That's what he began to do as we were looking at the rise of Muhammad previously. His instruction to the chiefs of the Syria war, inspired by the warlike fan fanaticism which advances to seize and affects to despise the object of earthly ambition. Remember, say the success of the prophet, that you are always in the presence of God, on the verge of death, in the assurance of judgment and the hope of the paradise. Avoid injustice and oppression. Consult with your brethren and study to preserve the love and confidence of your troops. When you fight the battles of the Lord, Acquit yourself like men without turning your backs, but let not your victory be stained with the blood of women and children. Destroy no palm trees, nor burn any fields of corn. Cut down no fruit trees, nor do any mischief to cattle, only such as you kill to eat. This is the explanation of Revelation 9 verse 4, that they were not to hurt what? The plants or anything, but prophetically you know the plant is a symbol of what? God's people, based on Psalms chapter 1, verse 1. It says, a righteous person is like a plant planted where? Near the river. So don't take this literally, but Muhammad providentially, or rather Abu Bakr is going to take this issue literally. But you have to view it prophetically. So, we'll say, 
destroy no palm trees, nor burn any field of corn, cut down no fruit trees, nor any mischief to cattle, only such as you kill to eat. When you make an, any covenant or article, stand to eat and be as good as your word. As you go on, you will find some religious person who live retired in monasteries and propose to themselves to serve God that way. Let them alone. So these are the people who had the seal of God. And neither kill them nor destroy their monasteries. And you will find another set sort of people that belong to the synagogue of Satan who have shaven crowns. Be sure you cleave their skulls and give them no quarter till they either turn Mahomet or pay tribute. So that was happening in this history of 150 years. So we come to this history, we see again what has, has been happening. In the year 1449, now we come to this history at the, at the termination of the 150 years. Remember, we are taking time to understand the natural, so that when you come to spiritual, this one will dictate how you understand this line based on our dispensation. In the year Prophetic Exposition, Volume 2, 182, Paragraph 2. 182, Paragraph 2, explaining this history. In the year 1449, John Paleogis, the Greek Empire, died but left no children to inherit his throne. And Constantine de Causes succeeded to it. But he will not venture to ascend the throne without the consent of Amurath, the Turkish Sultan. He therefore sent an ambassador to ask his consent and obtain it before he presumed to call himself sovereign. Remember from the commencement of the 150 years, Islam is established its empire by Ottoman. Ottoman began to establish his empire by invasion, invasion of who? Nicomedia. But after many years, he's going to be succeeded by other sultan. By the time we come here, we have a sultan called who? Amurath, thank you. So we have a person, a sultan called who? Amurath. Remember, they are invading the eastern side of where? Of Rome. Now by this time, the Greeks, they are superior in this region. Now in this Greek empire, remember, they are, they are doing what? The Greeks empire now have captured what? Constantinople. They are the ones who rule in Constantinople. But when the this Greek empire called John Paleogis. Let me put here. Just let me put 1449. We have John Paleogis. He's going to die. And he doesn't have a successor to take the throne of Constantinople. So what he does, there's another person, individual called who? Constantine. De causes. How do you write? Okay. Constantine de causes. But before Constantine de causes takes the throne of Constantinople, he realized that it's not, more, it's not more powerful. The powerful people here at this time, they are the sultans. And the powerful sultan at this time is who? <laughs> Amurath. So what Constantine de causes does, remember, he's a, Greece is not a Muslim power. These are Christian. So what he does is going to say, okay, before I ascend the throne, I recognize there's a person who is more powerful here. And if I'm not going to recognize his uh, power, he's going to subdue me. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask permission from Amurath in order to rule what? Constantinople. So what the causes does is going to surrender Is going to surrender his allegiance to who? To Amrath. Remember, if you are, a, you are a, this is a Greek empire, and they are ruling their own nation. Should you seek permission to another power for you to control your region? You don't need. But for him, because you see, Amrath is more powerful. Is going to do what? To ask permission in order to rule where? Constantinople. So here, what I want us to identify in this natural story, there is a. Voluntary what? He was not forced. Voluntary surrender. And who, who surrendered? Constantine de Causes surrendered to who? Amurath. He seeked permission in order to take charge of where? 
Constantinople. That's what he did. So in this history, what do we mark the beginning? This is the beginning of first war. What will this be? The beginning of second war. So let's go to Revelation 9 verse 12. It says, one war is past, and behold, there come two wars more hereafter. Where do we mark the end of the first war? Where do we mark the end of the first war? 40, 49. Where do we mark the commencement of the fifth trumpet? Yeah? The beginning of the fifth trumpet. Remember, the, the trumpet begins to sound. Then we have what? The war. Six or six. Six or six. So this is the beginning of the fifth trumpet. That is Revelation 9 verse 1. And the fifth trumpet does what? Sounded. And a star did what? Fall. So where do you mark? Trumpet sounds. It's a cause. What is the effect? The fall of what? Of the star. So where do you mark the beginning of the fifth trumpet? Six or six. And this marks the beginning of what? Of a war. War is what? Is a judgment at the beginning of the 50 months. Okay. So at the termination of 150 years, we are going to mark the the beginning of the uh, sixth trumpet. But we realize that there is a complicated structure here. Here, we say the second war does what? First war ends, and the second war does what? Begins. So let's go to Revelation 9, verse. Verse 12 of one war is past, and behold, there come two wars more hereafter. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, a day, and a month and a year for to slay the third part of what? Of men. So when you look at uh, the works of Joseph Leach, I've been using the work of Joseph Leach, but you can also read the works of Ray Smith. But Ray Smith, as I was looking at his writings, trying to compare both of them, I realized that what Leach is writing, Joseph Leach is writing. You go also to James White, the sounding of the seventh trumpet. What uh, James White is writing, is writing they, are, they are all copied from who? Josiah Leach. So, but you can use Uriah Smith because Uriah Smith is going to add more what? More information. But he is adding information from what Leach was, was just uh, doing. So, there's a, a number, or rather a year, which has been identified here. I'm just going to, to give us from July 27, 1449, we are going to add 391 years. 15 days based on those calculations just go and, and read those uh, verses so the commence of the second war is going to begin from July 27, 1449 to 11 August 1840 how the pioneers calculated it so Josiah Leach but I want us now to identify the history or rather, or rather what was happening throughout this time period so remember at the beginning of 150 months, Islam, they were commanded not to do what? To destroy, but to hurt. They were restrained. But when you come to the beginning of the 391 years, 15 days, a month, a year, and an hour, they are going to be done what? They are going to be, to be loosed. And they are going to be loosed. What are, going, what are they going to do? To destroy, to hurt. And there's something that have been identified there is that saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. What are the, these four angels? The four angels, they are the four principles uh, can say the four principles subject of Islam, the cities. And these were who? Damascus and Aleppo, uh, Baghdad, and Iconium. So these were the four principal corners of Islam. And they are going to be loose. And as they are going to be loose, they are going to be given a mandate to do what? 
to heart. So I want to read uh, something from Josiah Leach. I did not paste it, so let me check from. This prophetic exposition. In explaining the nature of, of, of the world that was to, ex to transpire in these 391 years, 15 days, it's going to. It said the first war was to continue from the rise of Mahomedism until the end of the five months. Then the first war was to end and the second war begin. So the second war is going to begin here. It was commanded to take off the restraints which had been imposed on the nation by which they were restricted to the work of tormenting men and their commission extended to slay the third part of men. This command came from the four horns of the golden altar which is before God. The four angels are the four principal sultanis of which the Ottoman Empire is composed, located in the country of the Euphrates. They had been restrained, God commanded and they were loosed. So in this period, these four principal subjects of Ottoman Empire, they are going to be done what? To be loosed. And they are going to be loosed, what are they going to do? To do the work of destruction. So we have to see in this period, how does this destruction look like? Uh, the four angels were loosed for an hour, a day and a month and a year to slay the third part of men. This period amounts to 391 years and 15 days, during which the Ottoman supremacy was to exist in Constantinople. But although the four angels were thus loosed by the voluntary submission of the Greeks, yet another doom awaited the seat of the empire. Amrath, the sultan to whom the submission of the causes was made and by whose permission he reigned in Constantinople, soon after died and was succeeded in empire in 1551 by Mahomet II. So remember this person Amrath, when Constantine de Causes seek permission to reign in Constantinople, is going to die in which year? 15? 14, 1451. So in 1451, Amrath is going to do what? To die. But he is going to be succeeded by another individual called who? Mahomet? Mahomet, they call... What is the name? Uh, Mahomet II. So who is Mahomet I? Who is Mahomet I? The one who rose in six or six. So it's going to be succeeded by another person called Mohammed II. So it's going to succeed Amrath. Remember, Amrath and Constantine de Causes, they had what? Good personal relation. Why? Because he just gave permission to, Constant to Constantine de Causes to, to rule where? Constantinople. But when Mohammed II is going to come, he was going to succeed Amrath, he's going to take that restraint. Now it's going to attack where? Constantinople. And that act of attacking is going to happen where? 1453. So I want to read a quotation from So what happened in 1451? It says the death of Amrath in 1451 and the succession of Mohammed II, a willy man full of ambition and restless of restraint, did not retard the conquest. So what Mohammed II wants to do, he wants to take Constantinople. Was to capture Constantinople. Peace was on his lips, but war was in his heart. So he just continued saying, peace, peace, but what was in his heart? A warlike spirit. So that was in the heart of uh, Mohammed II. And every energy was bent towards the accomplishment of his de this design. At midnight, 
he once started from his bed and demanded the immediate attendance of his prime vizier. The man came trembling, fearing the detection of some previous crime. He made his offering to the sultan, but was met with the words, I ask a present for a more valuable and important Constantinople. So what Mohammed II wants to do, he wants to take what? Constantinople. So this time round, they don't want the Greek emperors to, to take charge of Constantinople. They want the sultans to take charge of what? Constantinople. So that is the ambition that Mohammed II had in his heart. Mohammed II tested the loyalty of his soldiers, warned his ministers against the bribery of the Romans, studied the art of war and the use of what? Firearms. So before they attack Constantinople, they had to do what? There was what? Preparation. So in this time period, you can mark what? A preparation. Because the walls of Constantinople, which was the seat of the Roman Empire, it was more fortified that it was difficult for you to ravage it. So what they had to do, they had to make what? A preparation. Remember from July 27, 1449, you add 391 years, 15 days, is going to bring you where? 11 August, 1840. This is what Sister White reference in the book Great Controversy, page 334. He engaged the services of a founder of canon. So in this history, there's going to be what? An invasion of a new mode of what? Warfare which was going to be used to attack what? The walls of Constantinople. Who promised weapons that could bolter down the walls of, of the city? So that is the career of the Mahomet uh, II. So what happened in 1453? I, I've read this one from this reference, 14, 1451. You can get it clearly from the book, Story from the Sea of Patmos, page 174, paragraph 2. SSSP, page 174, paragraph 2, by... It's describing the history of 1451 by Haskell. So let's go to 1443. What is happening in this history? 1453. He, Mohammed II, accordingly made a preparation for besieging and taking the city. The siege commenced on the 6th of April, 1543. So this siege began when? April. Sorry. April 6th. 1453 and ended in the taking of the city and death of the last of the Constants on the 16th day of May. So it's going to begin April 6th to when? 16th of the same year in the month of May. They are going now to fully captured what? Constantinople. So the Sultanists under the rulership of Mohammed II, they are going to uh, attack Constantinople and they are going to take charge of it. So remember, there was a fearful preparation that was made before an expedition towards Constantinople. So in 1543, what happened, Mohammed II is going to invade Constantinople and they're going to take charge of it. And the last Constantine is going to die when? 16th of May of the same year, which marks the end of the capture of Constantinople by the Islam power. And the eastern city of the Caesars became the seat of who? The Ottoman? Empire. So in this, in the year 1453, the Ottoman Empire that began to be established in this time period is now fully going to be under the hand of who? Of Islam. Uh, story from the Sea of Patmos, page 174, paragraph 2. What does it say? April 1453, the memorable siege was formed at the sound of the war trumpet the forces of Mohammed II were increased by swarms of fearless fanatics until at Franza has said the besieging army numbered 258,000. Constantinople fell. The last vestige of Roman greatness was gone. 
and the Muslim conquerors trample the religion of Rome in the dust. So you can see the issue of religion here. So the Roman religion, the Christian power, is going to do what? It's going to die. It's going, or like it's going to be extinguished. Sorry. This memorable event affected all future history. The fall shocked what? Europe. So when Constantinople was, was, was actually uh, captured, it shocks the world at that time. The world was shocked and they did not actually, uh, they were not looking forward to see Constantinople being taken by who? The Muslims. They were not in that idea that indeed Islam is going to take Constantinople, is going to attack Constantinople. But when Constantinople was attacked by the, the Sultan, it really shocked the world. Europe was shocked. So we are going now to see as a natural story what is going to happen in 2021. So we don't know how it's going to look like, but the natural story is going to give us an immediate effect how this history is going to look like. Uh, and the conversion had not passed before the light of the Reformation broke the darkness which shrouded the Western Empire. So here, the light of Reformation did what? The message of the Reformers. What happened to the message of Reformers in this time period? It went forward. The Reformers, they were given time to do what? To, to give that message. And you can really actually put 1529 in this history if you want to, if you like to, but you can realize that the light of reformation in this particular time continued to go out rapidly because the subject of Islam had arrived in this history. And if you were to put 1529 in this history, if you read Great Controversy, page 187, you realize that the tax was the instrument that aided who? The reformers to continue the work of what? Reformation. So we are going to see how does this look like because we know that 2021 uh, is the harvest for who? The Levite. So we don't know how Islam is going to have an effect to this way, Mark. So the light of reformation broke the darkness which shrouded the Western Empire. While the smoke from the bottomless pit was setting over the east, streaks of light heralded are coming down in the nation of Europe. So I want us to look at this way, Mark, 11 August 1840. I was, I was to, I was not purposing to put this 22nd October 1844 here, but the reason why I extended it here is because there's a, there's a, there's a, one of the author, I don't know his name, is it false, he's saying that he was shown in vision that the sixth trumpet was still sounding up to where? 18? It was not that sounding, but because we used to mark the end of the sixth trumpet where? 11 August 18? 40. But to his vision, he said that the sixth trumpet was still doing what? Extending till 18? 44. And we know this is close of probation based on the lines we have been doing. And I extended this one from Sunday law to where? Close of probation. 22nd October, you can really uh, mark with close of probation. So what happened 11 August 1840? Remember, 11 August, August 1840 marks the end of which time period? 391 years, 15 days. So at the commencement of the 391 years, 15 days, what was happening here? There was what? A voluntary surrender of one entity to another entity. So we are going to expect, as we are going to read, there's also going to be what? A voluntary what? Surrender here. This is from Prophetic Exposition, Volume 2, page 189, paragraph 1. Remember, the Sultan power is now reigning, taking charge of this history. Commencing when the 150 years ended in 1449, the period will end August 11, 1840. I'm just paraphrasing the words of Josiah Leach. That's why I'm requesting us, please go and read. The works of Uriah Smith is very, very, very important. He'll give all the detailed explanation of this history. Because of time, you're not going to read everything. Judging from the manner of the commencement of the Ottoman supremacy, that it was by a voluntary acknowledgement on the part of the Greek emperor that he only reigned 
by permission of the tax sultan, we should naturally conclude that the fall of, the, of or departure of the Ottoman independence will be brought about in the same way, that at the end of the specified period, the sultan will voluntarily surrender his independence into the hands of the Christian past from whom he received it. Great Controversy, page 334, paragraph 4. In the year 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy excited widespread interest. Two years before, Josiah Leach, one of the leading ministers preaching the Second Advent, published an exposition of Revelation 9, predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire. According to his calculation, this power was to be overthrown in AD 1840 sometime in the month of August. And only a few days previous to its accomplishment, he wrote, Alloy, allowing the first period 150 years to have been exactly fulfilled before the causes ascended the throne by permission of the tax, and that the 391 years 15 days commence at the close of the first period, it will end on the 11th of August 1840, when the Ottoman power in Constantinople may be expected to be broken. And this, I believe, will be found, will be found to be the case. Josiah Leach. So Josiah Leach is going to take this history and say, since there was a voluntary surrender of Constantine the Coast to Amrath, the same manner is going to happen at the end of what? 391 years, 15 days. So what happened in this history, there was a war, there was a tension between Egypt, this power, Egypt, and who? Turkey. In that history. So in this tension between Turkey and Egypt, there was a, a sultan, I can say it's called Pasha, called who? Mahomet? Mahomet Ali, the Pasha of Egypt. So they had this uh, tension between they had tension between uh, there was tension between Egypt and Turkey. And what happened, Turkey is going to evade to invade the territory of who? Egypt, but remember, Turkey is an Islam what power. So as Turkey is invading Egypt, Egypt is going to like becoming uh, fragile. It's going to become feeble. It's not going to outdo who Turkey. Not necessarily, but Egypt really Egypt is more stronger than who Turkey. I'm just, I've just changed it. I'm sorry. Egypt is going to be more powerful than who Turkish uh, power. So Turkey is going to do is going to seek uh, permission from the European powers. And these European powers, just uh, to remind us, they were who? Someone to remind me? They were England? And who? Russia? Prussia and who? I forgot the one name. Austria, thank you. Austria. These are Christian nations. So Muhammad Ali of Egypt is going to seek permission from this Christian nation to help them overcome who? I mean, Turkey, excuse me, Turkey, I don't know the, the, the Sultan by that time was who? So it's a very uh, tough name I did not put here. So or rather Turkey is going to seek permission from these four Christian nations to help them overcome who? Mohammed Ali, the Pasha of Egypt. And this ultimatum that was placed throughout this history, Egypt, Turkey, by that, uh, that kind of decision that he made to seek permission from this Christian nation, according to Josiah Leach, how he understood it, is going to mark the end of the supremacy of whom? The Ottoman? Empire in Constantinople because they are not going to do anything already. They have put an ultimatum that if Egypt is going to misbehave, is going to attack Turkey, Turkey is not going to respond. But who is not who is going to respond to protect them? There's these four European are uh, Christian nation. So the principle that I want us to identify is that Turkey is going to surrender to who? The four Christian nation, just the way. Constantine de Cose surrendered to who? Amurath. So that's the principle that I want us to identify. But there is a lot of uh, detailed information that we need to look. And I'm going to explain this one 
when we'll be looking at the the Syrian war in the Middle East history, how they understood Daniel 11 verse 40 according to them. Because as we're looking at that, we are going to see that the king of the south was Egypt and the king of the north, based how they understood it, is who? Turkey, but based on the political context, they were surrounded too. So, when you come later, I don't know whether time is over. I'm remaining with 10 minutes. Okay, so in that 10 minutes, I'm going to review this, this history. So what I want us to identify here is that there was a restraint that was imposed upon who? Upon Islam. Turkey could not invade who? Egypt. But what it does, it surrender its allegiance to who? To England, Russia, Prussia, and who? Austria. So that is the restraint that the pioneers are going to mark in 11 August 1840, as we have read from the book Great Controversy, 334, paragraph 4. So I'm going to end this line here. The reason why I extended 22nd October 1844 is because I wanted to mark the end of the sounding of the sixth trumpet. And if you are to draw this line here, 22nd October 1844 is going to line with the close of probation, where we mark the end of the third war. So just to do a summary for that 10 minutes that we have remained with. We were looking at the wars, and we were saying in 606 AD, this Revelation 9 verse 1, it says that the fifth angel sounded and a star fell from heaven to the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And we identified that that star is who? Mahomet. And Mahomet, when he was rising, there are two principal powers in the east that were hindering him from rising. What were these two powers? Persia and Rome. Who was more powerful between the two? Persia under the rulership, rulership of who? Kosros. So what Kosros is doing in his career to exalt himself in Constantinople, in this region, he's going to receive a letter from one of the citizens from where? From Mecca. And in this letter, this citizen, they don't know the person, he's going to say, hey, hey, hey Kosros, in Arabia, there's a prophet who has done what? Has risen up. And we want you to do what? to recognize him. But did Kosros recognize him? He didn't. What he did, he told the letter and sent the ambassador who was sent to bring that letter and say, we are not going to recognize him. So when, when Muhammad realized that, what did he say? Okay, because you have failed to recognize me, listen, in fears to come, because you have been having this tension between you and the, and the Romans, you are going to do what? to fall. So that is the prediction that Mahomet made. And in real sense, the Romans and Persian, they are going to have these constant war tensions. And they are going to meet in a very terrible battle that we call the Battle of who? The Battle of Nineveh. And in this battle, the, the armies of, the, of Kosros, they are going to really be depleted. Even the Roman himself, even though they are going to win this battle, they are going also to be depleted. The strength of the Romans is not going to be the same as it was in the, in the beginning. So when these two parts are going to become feeble, it, it actually paved the way for the rise of who? Muhammad, because he doesn't have now what? Obstacles. So these two powers, Persia and Rome, they are going to be obstacle for the rise of Muhammad. But when they, they were depleted in the battle of Nineveh, Muhammad is going to rise up. Now, in the first war, Muhammad, or rather in the beginning of the fifth trumpet, Muhammad is going to have many adherents who are referred to as what? Locusts. And you have read from the book of Proverbs 30, verse 27, that the locusts have no what? Kings. But they go all by bands. So at the beginning of Islam, it's interesting, they had no king, but they had what? A false prophet. So when you go through, we track the history or rather the beginning of the first war, Revelation 9 verse 
verse uh, 11, at this time now they are going to have what? A king. And what is the name of this king in Hebrew tongue? Abaddon. But in the Greek term it's called what? Apollyon. And we look at the meaning of this Abaddon and Apollyon, it means what? Destruction. So for many years, after the death of Muhammad, he's going to be succeeded with many caliphs, including Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr, he had this ambition to, to set up what? An Islamic kingdom. He wants to establish an Islamic kingdom. So all the successors of Muhammad, what they are going to do is to establish what? They are going to fulfill the promise of who? Abu Bakr. To set up what? An Islamic kingdom. And the, an individual who began establishing an Islamic kingdom was who? Othman. Okay? So it was Othman who established what we call what? Othman Empire. And when did he begin establishing it? At the commencement of the 150 years, when he attacked what? Nicomedia. Nicomedia was just a city of who? Greece. So he's going to attack Nicomedia in July 20, 25, 27, the year 1299, which marked the beginning of 150 years. So in these 150 years, what was commanded to Islam power? They were to do what? To hurt, torment, but not do what? to kill but there was an instruction given to them you only hurt who those who don't have the seal of god you have to hurt them but those who have the seal of god please leave them don't hurt them so that is the career that was happening here so in this holy war that the ottoman empire was engaging in their career was just to establish themselves and they were, while they were fighting what were they saying this is a holy war we fight in order to secure what? Paradise. So that's what they were saying. So at the end of the 150 years, we are going to see the change of scene. In this history, in July 27, 1449, we had many, many successors of Ottoman. By this time, we have a sultan called who? Uh, Amurath. Amurath is now the head of the Ottoman Empire. But there's something which was happening in Greece. In Greece, there's a Constantine who died. I mean, there was a ruler who died. Who was he? John Paleoges. I don't know where I wrote that name. Here. So in 1449, John Paleoges is going to do what? To die. But he did not have what? A successor. So because he doesn't have a successor, there's another individual. Who was he? Constantine Decauses. Before Constantine Decauses ascended the throne of Greece, he realized that there is another power which is strong by this time. And who, 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 which is this power? Islam. The Ottoman Empire, Hamrath. So he's going to seek permission from Amrath in order to do what? To, to, to take the kingdom. So Amrath is going to give him what? Permission. But remember, who seek that permission? is Constantine. He just voluntarily seek permission from Amrath. So in this history, Amrath will begin to, Constantine the causes, is going to take charge of, of Greece empire. Now, after some period, after some years, I don't know how many years are this, uh, two years. After two years, Amrath is going to do what? To die. But remember, Constantine the cause is still ruling in Greece Empire. And when Amrath died, he's going to be succeeded by Mahomet, Mahomet II. But Mahomet II is going to take charge of the Ottoman Empire. He's going to break this uh, agreement that was made between Amrath and Constantine. And his idea now, we are going now to take what? Constantinople. That's, remember, Greece is the one who actually was ruling Constantinople by this time. So Mahomet II, his aspiration is to take charge of Constantinople. He's going to break this agreement that was made between Amrath and Constantine. And before he take charge of Constantinople, he knew Constantinople is a very fortified city. And for you to capture Constantinople, you need to make a thorough preparation first. So what he's going to do, they are going to invent what? Cannons, they're going to invent most uh, dangerous weapons in order to take charge of Constantinople. And in the month of April 6 to 16 of May, in the year 14, 1453, what are they going to do? They are going to invade what? Constantinople, and they are going to take charge of it. Remember, 
July 27, 1449 marks the commencement of the 391 years, 15 days. If you add from this one, it's going to take us where? 11 August 1814. But the main subject of this prophecy of Islam is to be a shield, is to protect the people who have what? The seal of? of God. And we read from 1453 that when Constantinople fell, what happened to the light of reformation? It did what? It increased. The light of reformation, it went forward. It gave the Christian, those who are worshipping God now, to have chance to do what? To go forward. Another thing we can identify from this quotation by Stephen Askell is that what happened to the religion of Rome in this history? There was scourge. They were really hurt. But while the religion of Rome was hurt in this period, the true religion, the reformers, by this time uh, period of history, they were given a chance to carry forward the work of what? Reformation. And remember, if you were to draw the 1260 time period, which began in 538 to 1798, where do you place 1543? Uh, 14. Is it in this history or here? Yes. It's here, isn't it? So this way mark is here. So when Islam is doing its work, it's really it's protecting the people of God who have the seal of God, those who worship God in truth. And you can either, even extend 1529, this word Sister White gives us in the book Great Controversy. So you can see the Turk, the Turk, the Turkish, or rather the Turk, Turkish power, they are acting. As a, as a beacon of light to the reformers who are actually challenging the authority of papal supremacy in this history. So we come to this history at the end of 391 years, in 11 August 1840, as you have read from Josiah Leach, he's going to give us an explanation that the manner in which 391 years began, it's the same manner in which it will do what? It will end. Remember, when you read Great Controversy, page 397, Sister White is going to give us which power? Turkey is going to give us Turkish power in this history. So when you come to this history, before we, uh, we arrived 11 August 1840, 11 August, the year 1840, we had two factions who were contending for supremacy. And this power, they were who? Turkey and Egypt. And we, when historically, if you go to this region, you realize that these are Muslim what? Best countries. So they have um, this tension. And Egypt is going to be more stronger than who? Turkey. Turkey. You get that? So Egypt is going, it's like want to secede the power of who? Turkey. Now Turkey is, is looking at this issue. The European powers also, they have interest where? In this Muslim countries. Remember, if you go to those seas, you realize that these powers, they were intimately connected with some, some natural resources. And th what are these natural resources? Oil. And England, Russia, Prussia, and Austria, these two powers can say are uh, the Mediterranean Sea. Because when you look at Egypt, the map of Egypt, is it near the Mediterranean Sea? Yes, it's near the Mediterranean Sea. And that's where the, the, the subject of oil is really interested. So you realize that Egypt and Turkey, they are kind of separated by what? The Mediterranean Sea. They are close. They have this advantage to do what? To have oil. But remember, this Christian power, England, Russia, Prussia, and Austria, they are also interested in what? In oil. So they are going now to put their interest where? They want now to have this influence in these two powers. Now, the, uh, as these two powers, they have tension and conflicts, what will these two powers, these powers do? They want actually to, to have influence in this nation, but their interest really is not about these two powers. Their interest is based upon oil. But remember, Turkey is actually a uh, near the Mediterranean Sea where there is oil mining. So as Turkey is losing power, all this nation, they want to come and help who? Turkey. And if you help Turkey, will also Turkey help you? Yes, they're going to help you back. So Egypt is more stronger than who? Turkey. So Turkey is seeing like it's losing the war. So what it does, 
is going to seek permission from this for Christian nation in order to help him to overcome who? Egypt. So in this history, based on Josiah Leach, what he was doing from eight, uh, 1838, Turkey, or rather this Christian nation, they are going to put an ultimatum. An ultimatum really is just an agreement that Egypt you should not, not attack Turkey based on this, on this condition. Also Turkey, you should not do this and that. So when actually Turkey, rather the Ottoman Empire, is going to surrender itself to the allegiance of England, Russia, Prussia, and Austria, that's what we mark the restraint of what? Islam. It was not really a, a hot war. There was no even war that was fought here like a hot war. What we make a restraint is that Turkey has just surrendered its power to who? To the four Christian nation. And that's what we mark the end of the 391 years, 15 days. It's really a, 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 a long history of what was happening between Egypt and Turkey, and I recommend that we read uh, Uriah Smith how we're explaining it. So this is that I've explained here. We are going to, to explain it more because we are going to see that they are also connected to who? To Syria at that particular time. Between Syria, Egypt, and Turkey, we are going to see all those wars as we'll be looking at the, the Syrian war in the history of the Millerites, and, and then we make application in our day and age. So that is the narrative that was happening here. So as we come in our next lesson, we are going now to see how does this application, the natural sto the spiritual story, look like. What are these two powers symbolized in 1989 that sparked the rise of radical Islam in 1989? Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness and mercies, for this privilege that you have given unto us to gather here to study your word. We are living in a solemn period of this world history. The signs of the times declare that the end is near. Father, we know not how thy spirit moveth upon men to convince them of their sin. We have many millions of Adventists in this uh, globe, but you saw it better that this small group, among others in, on planet Earth, to understand this message. And as we have are the falling away and others are joining we ask you God may you help us to be faithful may you help us give us strength that we may understand these truths they are very difficult and without you we cannot understand them we ask for thy Holy Spirit to move on our hearts that the difficult question and subject that we are handling we may understand them as we prepare us for thy second coming as we have a, a small break May you help us to continue contemplating upon the theme of salvation. And may you help us to be of one mind, to esteem one another better, ready to be corrected, and ready to learn and unlearn. Be with us and guide us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.